The year is 1998. Squaresoft are heading into their all-time peak era. Every few months they're pumping out an all-time classic game. From the seminal Final Fantasy VII with 8 on the horizon, the idiosyncratic Saga Frontier, busting out strategy epics like Final Fantasy Tactics, Front Mission 2, even delving into shmups and somehow creating the best shooter on the PlayStation Einhander. They had dungeon crawlers, they had fighting games, but there was one emerging genre that Square had yet to touch. Horror. Yes, brought to the public eye thanks to the recent success of Resident Evil and its impending sequel, Resident Evil 2, Square won a summer that action. Square's answer to Capcom's classic wasn't as unashamed as others out there. This wasn't just a copy and paste job. Parasite Eve was made to combine the survival horror genre with what Square knew best, JRPGs. And thus, perhaps the first horror JRPG was born. First released in Japan in 1998 and North America in September of that year, Europe once again was shown the middle finger by Square. Europe did not get Parasite Eve, which is weird because they did get Parasite Eve too. My personal experience with Parasite Eve is rather limited. Uh, I watched my friend play it for a little bit and then later on I bought it for my PSP, where I played it for 5 minutes before going back to Final Fantasy Tactics, as you would do. So it's basically a brand new experience for me, and you, you voted for it. Specifically, my Patreon producers. Thanks for voting for it. And this video is dedicated to my dear patrons, whether the producer tier or not. Why do they support me? Well, maybe they like me, but mainly because they get a lot of great perks, including these big daddy videos earlier, ad-free. They get access to a secret Discord for project updates and behind-the-scenes stuff. They even get a whole bonus video for every big video I make. For Suicoden 2, I looked at Suicoden card stories. For Skies of Arcadia, I looked at the producer's other work, Deep Fear. And for Parasite Eve, I'm taking a look at The Bouncer, which shares the same director, Akashi Takita. Consider heading over to patreon.com slash abitmorejordan for even more me. So, Parasite Eve. As always with these videos, I'm splitting them into two parts. Firstly, going through the story beat by beat, explaining everything to you, and hopefully entertaining you with a few jokes along the way. The actual proper analysis will be at this timestamp, but even if you've played the game before and don't want to go through the story again, I'm pretty sure I'll still entertain you, and there'll also be small analysis in there too. And of course, spoilers throughout. You can't make an hour and 45 minute retrospective without spoiling most of the game. It's impossible. Don't be one of those people complaining. Before the game even begins, we're treated to a highly explosive, action-filled introduction. It's actually very spoilerific about what the hell's gonna happen in this game. There's fighter jets, scrambling cop cars, battleships ablaze, and maple syrup leaking in Central Park. It's all action goodness. I was expecting a survival horror game, not Die Hard. After pressing start, you'll come across the first proper cutscene. You can see that it's the evening, it's cold, it's wintry, and it's actually Christmas Eve, and the opera is receiving its guests. From a car pops Parasite Eve's main protagonist, Aya, or Aya Brea. You can name her if you want to, but I'm not fancying naming her after myself. She's not sexy enough to be called Jordan. Tonight, she's on a date with a dude who's a bit of a <clears throat> your typical my dad's important, aren't I amazing kind of thing. As with anyone as annoying as this dude, Aya is hardly the most enthusiastic of dates. Maybe she's got a lot going on, or maybe the writers were trying to channel some of that Final Fantasy VIII spirit that was being worked on at the same time. She starts off a bit mopey. Anyways, they're almost late to their seats for the hottest opera in town. The scene is something like a Shakespearean play. A father refuses his son in marrying someone deemed to be a witch. As one of the songs begins to play, the leading lady stretches her lungs with a powerful piece, but as she meets the eyes of Aya, something changes. I 
I told you it was the hottest opera in town, perfect for a winter's evening. Really warms the cockles. As the panic unfolds, only Aya and her date are still there, seemingly unharmed. She shoves him out of the way and her instinct of duty sets in because she is a cop with the NYPD. Who cares if everyone's been turned into a roasted sweet potato, she runs up to the stage to confront the singer. How she knows she's the reason all of this is happening, I don't know. Is it because she's having a sing-along while everyone's burning in the audience? She's a professional. As the old saying goes, the show must go on. Even when the audience are being incinerated. She's a pro, you can't knock her for that. But Aya is taking umbrage with her. This actress is impressed that Aya is okay, but says that she should be awakening soon. Whatever that means. And she starts talking nonsense about cells and stuff before you bugger it and start fighting her. This is the basic battle tutorial. It's an interesting one as you walk around in real time waiting for your action gauge to fill up. Usually you have to run around dodging the enemy's attacks. When you're ready to do an action, you'll see a polygonal sphere, which is a contradiction, I know, but shapes this complicated have weird names and I'm not even going to try. This shows you your weapon range. If you can get the enemy within this dome thingy, you can do damage to it. If you try attacking them while they're outside of it, you'll either miss or do very minimal damage. Popping one shot into her, Aya says that she feels like she's getting hot inside. Sadly, not in the sexy steamy kind of way, more like in the human barbecue type of way. But something awakens inside of her, Aya doesn't understand what is going on. But a couple of pot shots more and this actress lady flees. Not before warning Aya that the more she uses the power she inherits, the more she will end up like her. And at that moment, you get a flashback to a hospital bed with a child on it. Obviously, you have no idea what's going on right now. Back to the present you chase after her, she floats away backstage. As you drop down, you see the same girl again from the flashback you just had. You feel like you kind of know her, but you're not sure. But there's no time to waste, you have to take this crazy floating actress down. This is technically the first mini dungeon of the game. It's split into two parts and does give a decent introduction to what you'll expect throughout your experience. It's just a long corridor with locked rooms and you've got to explore them. But first, to add to the freakiness of the fire people, as you walk down the corridor, a rat. I knew Carnegie Hall weren't paying their cleaners properly. Anyways, this happens. So, uh, yeah, let's fight this giant mutated rat. It's at this point you'll scream in agony about how painfully slow Aya moves. And it ain't just because she's wearing high heels. This is seriously how fast she runs. A couple of pops of the gun and it should be down. While I have to say the horror aspect in this game isn't as strong as I was expecting, seeing the burnt corpses in this dressing room is actually quite shocking. And even one of them is still barely alive. In their last breath, they tell you it must have been Melissa. Melissa, the actress. In one room, there's a clown. And you're probably thinking this is just some horrible mutated creature you have to blast away too. But no, it's genuinely just a clown. He somehow seems unaware of what's going on. And you tell him to quickly run away. He does so. And then you hear him scream. He ain't Krusty the Clown, he's Crispy the Clown. And that's your fault. You told him to run out to his death. Well done, Aya. Investigating around, you'll enter Melissa's dressing room with the diary nice and open on the dresser. In it, Melissa describes being given the opportunity to get the starring role in the play, but ending up having to share the part with another actress. She's desperate to be number one and the best, despite both her mental and physical health deteriorating. She keeps taking medication, refusing to see a doctor, and eventually her rival mysteriously dies in a fire. She gets a solo part, but she's obviously coked up to a rather generous tits. The diary ends the day before. 
Finding a key to the rehearsal room, you hear the piano playing. It's rather beautiful and melancholy, but as you walk up to her, she goes full schizo. She says she is Melissa, but her body is getting hot. Very hot. And then she says she is Eve. Melissa is gone, and Eve is here. And the first boss battle begins as she starts laser blasting you. Fully admit, I wasn't quite ready for this and I did die. And uh, uh, I didn't save my game. So I had to play that whole part again. Yeah, saving in this game is fine. You just have to know that you can only save at telephones. Apparently that's the equivalent of checking in with the station. I did try and save here, but sometimes the game can be a little less than generous with the hitboxes and stuff. You have to be rather precise at where you stand. And my patience lasted about ooh, half a millisecond before I decided, smeg it, I'll save later. It's the only part of the game. How hard can it be? <laughs> it's actually not that hard to be fair. I was just pretty lax about the whole thing. I didn't pick up the extra armor in one of the rooms or fight enough monsters to pick up the extra medicine. Yeah, don't rush this part. Not that I did, I just forgot about the rooms that I initially couldn't get into. Again, she makes a statement about your mitochondria. You know, the thing you all remember learning about in school while you were rudely interrupted from your mid-morning nap in science class. And another flashback of sorts. Again with the girl in the room. None of this makes a lick of sense, not even a whiff of sense. Following her once more, you end up in the sewers. Don't call them a trope! Mutant frogs enter the fray this time, and Parasite Eve does a really spiffing job with its enemies. Yes, some of them are recycled occasionally, but their attack patterns are varied and each need to be tackled in a different way. Mostly in a how the freak do I dodge their attacks before popping off some caps in their ass kind of way. Running around like a headless chicken was my top tactic. And I should also mention Parasite Eve is very generous with its treasure chests. If you can find them, they blend in so well with the environment. I swear I only saw most of them because when a battle initiates, you get a quick x-ray flash on the screen which makes them stick out. If it wasn't for that, I would have missed most of them. So you're chasing this little girl and Melissa until you eventually come across a dead end of sorts. It's not a long dungeon of course, but just when you think you've cornered her, she laughs as she states that only you can take her on. If anyone else comes close, they will burn. The perfect excuse to have a one fighter party. Aya doesn't understand why, but this Eve lass states her mitochondria know what's going on and they always have known. Is this one of them, I can feel it in my bones kind of situations? You know like when you visit your gran and she complains about the nurse who did a health check and she's like, she's a wrong one that one. Why none? I can feel it in my bones. All right. Solids don't mean anything to this lady. She turns into maple syrup and flows through the bars. Very convenient. She buggers off, but in comes a giant crocodile. I knew the New York sewers were home to many a dark secret, but uh, I didn't think crocodiles were one of them. This is a boss battle. Yeah, you've had a few in a row. And if you don't know what you're doing, you're going to get absolutely mullered here. Since a few bosses in this game have multiple targets on their body, this killer croc has a head and its tail. If you're very naive, you think blowing its brains out would be the optimal strategy. But no, don't be an idiot. That won't do anything. First, take out its tail. At that point, it'll go into a second stage of the fight where the head is more vulnerable as it spits fireballs at you. With the croc down and nowhere else to go, you automatically surface outside Carnegie Hall where a reporter questions you about what went on and how you seem to be the sole survivor. I am obviously not in the mood, nor the right frame of mind, can't get her words out properly and into the scene comes a big dude who punches the reporter right in the back of the head, telling him to get away. And Aya, with an absolute big brain move, name drops him as Daniel right in front of the camera. Dude, that's not cool. This is Daniel. He's your partner in the NYPD. Although after this assault, he's probably going to get fired and bankrupt by the inevitable lawsuit. But this is the 90s. This is when overzealous cops were the cool thing rather than criminal psychopaths. On the ride back to the station, 
Daniel laughs at Aya's date for running away like a wuss. This is despite the reporter literally telling you everyone died except you, so either Daniel is laughing at a dead guy or the reporter was mistaken. And let me tell you, I'd probably have a beer with Daniel, but I wouldn't put it past him to laugh at a corpse. There's a bit of banter between these two. Daniel jokes about Aya going to the opera and dating a doofus, while Aya goes straight for the jugular and comments about how much of a terrible father Daniel is. It's Christmas Eve, he's a single parent, why the frig is he always working? Women really know how to hit where it hurts. Welcome to late 90s Manhattan. God, I love this 3D rendering of the city, especially at night time. Aya monologues about the nightmare that's about to unfold over the next six days, which means that one, we know she survives, Two, we know there's going to be six days in this game. Come on, Aya, that's spoilers. And we're already on day two. Nice, I'm blasting through this game. It's going to be a pretty short video. <clears throat> the next day comes as Aya is at the station with her colleagues. She's tired, but she's the only one who knows what really went on in that place. Some believe her, some don't believe her. But not in the she's nuts kind of way, just in the... So that lady set everyone in fire, then morphed into a monster and blobbed away out of the sewers with a giant, giant crocodile? Okay. That kind of way, you know? So having been debriefed, you're ordered to go and get a better weapon than the one you have. You've been authorized to carry heavy weaponry. Here you get introduced to the weapons clerk who, ironically, is very anti-gun. You see what they did there? This is where you learn about gun upgrades. If you find tools in the environment, you can then combine two weapons together, which discards one of them, but gives nice bonus stats to the one you want to keep. I paid almost zero attention to this in the first half of the game, because the interface was as clear as mud. I wasn't really sure what I was doing. But it is important, so definitely experiment with it so you get a feel for how it works. You can thank me later. By the way, you are free to raid the police station to your heart's content. You know, just open people's lockers, take some medicine, some armor, some ammo. The place is your oyster, as in it feels like phlegm going down your throat. I don't know what I'm saying. Anyways, to advance the plot, you need to meet this boy over here who's determined to be as red as possible. You can tell a bloke dressed him. This is Daniel's son. It's Christmas Day. He's looking for his dad. He's got tickets to a concert in Central Park. But his dad is resoundingly rubbish and says, sorry, need to give you a rain check on that. Merry Christmas, son. Before you can get too annoyed at the dude, his son runs off probably to find his mother. It's implied he's divorced, which, let's face it, who the frig would blame her? He's a crap dad and a crap cop. Anyways, back to the story. The chief has called a press conference and wants you to attend. But also, keep your mouth shut. Probably because you have a history of blabbing your mouth off in front of the press like name-dropping Daniel after he just committed assault. But also because he wants to protect you. You're the only survivor. Which means that her date did die, I guess. And the press will probably turn onto you. So keep it shut. Unfortunately, Aya's mouth has the Tourette's of truth, because in the middle of the conference, she starts shouting, Mitochondria, Melissa, is Eve, and just all this kind of nonsense. Going full nut conspiracy. Even if it's true, you just don't say that in front of the press. You look like an absolute weirdo. That went well. But before the chief can get into full rant beast mode, your hide is saved by a telephone call from a Japanese scientist who says he wants to meet you. He can't speak English very well, but he managed to swing the word mitochondria in there. At least one dude in the office knows what that is, and despite being a hard-boiled cop, probably the kind that assists the real detective in the TV show, he remembers that a scientist at the museum recently wrote a paper on the subject matter. Look, I'm not saying homicide detectives can't take an interest in cellular science, but he doesn't seem the type. He probably goes fishing at the weekends. He'd have more interest in perches than scientific papers. Right, let's go talk to the second scientist mentioned, the one in the museum, not the Japanese dude. So yeah, off to the museum you go. You can see this is the world map of sorts. New locations open up as the plot goes along, and you can revisit previous areas if you want to. Not that you would want to, because it doesn't offer much in terms of content. Between story locations, you often get some car dialogue which gets you up to speed about what you're planning on doing and why. We're going to the museum to see Dr. Hans Clamp, who I heard is the brother of the world-famous researcher Dr. Nipple Clamp. German heritage. You enter the Museum of Natural History. It's closed because, you know, it's Christmas Day. But instead of the usual gaming trope, you don't have to break in. The guard just says, yeah, come on in. You meet Clamp in his office. He's an antisocial dude, barely listening to a word you say while he types away on his computer. 
As he finally turns around to acknowledge you, Aya has another flashback. She's had a few like this already. A girl on a hospital bed. This time with the doctor looking over her. Is she familiar with this guy already? We don't know. It's just a tease for what we find out later. He laughs at their lack of knowledge about the subject, but he comes up with the crackpot theory that mitochondria is alive. Like it's a separate being, an animal or creature in its own right clinging onto humans. One may say almost like a parasite. Although we can't live without them, they produce our energy, and perhaps enough to set someone on fire or turn them to liquid. He goes on to tell you the true power of mitochondria, giving off a lot of science babble which I am not qualified nor willing to research the matter to see if it's true or not. But considering how mental this game is, I'm willing to bet the writer pulled it out of the arse of his brain. It's fascinating nonsense, and he goes on and on about how mitochondria is more advanced than humans. But once Aya mentions the being called Eve, the dude just switches off. And I love the fact Daniel is going apeshit here. There's nothing more to talk about, so you just want to head back. I'd have thought to the police station, but it feels more like you're trying to get to Alderaan. This is like Star Wars warp speed levels. Back at the station, not Alderaan, you've got a lead. Melissa was due to perform at a concert in Central Park this evening. A big audience is due, including Daniel's son and his ex-wife. They cannot risk it. What if she actually shows up and burns people alive? Daniel runs off and you have to get his back. When you get there, things are already funky, because conveniently for the sake of only having a one character party, Daniel can't go very far, otherwise his hand gets a bit toasty. It's all on you to rescue his family and everyone else in the audience. Central Park is the second dungeon in this game, and it feels very weird to say that. Imagine telling your friend that a dungeon in the latest game you're playing is Central Park. Is this Friends the video game? Well, it's hardly a looker. I mean, I dig the style, but it's not the vibe we're used to seeing in TV shows and movies, or in real life if you've ever been there. This is quite a huge place, as you'd expect. It's a bit of a maze at times, but it's one of the more memorable locations in the game. Because not only do you travel through leafless trees of the park battling monsters, but you end up in the zoo. And the excuse for all the monsters here is that they are all animals that have been mutated. So, you're getting snakes, Australian monkeys, and even a goddamn polar bear or two. Again, it's all about learning their patterns. You'll definitely want to fight everything because you'll start to learn new powers, which are kind of like this game's magic system. Healing spells are very much needed alongside a power shot. If you want a no-nonsense end to the battle. The main point here is to head to the concert venue. Does the zoo have a musical stage? Those poor animals. No wonder they broke out and mutated, have an earache all day. You head there just in time to see Eve on the stage with the audience looking at her. And... It's too late. There is no fire this time, but the entire audience bursts into maple syrup. It's actually remarkably revolting, their trouser leg bursting like they've just had a nuclear evacuation from their rectum. The goo comes together and buggers off. It's too late for them, but you still need to stop Eve. As you head backstage, you see that little girl once again. She's been everywhere, and you probably already guessed who it is by now. Or have you? I don't know. You confront Eve, but she just hovers away once more as you give chase. There is a running theme to this game, with the emphasis on running. There's still half a dungeon to go by the time you've got here. There are two boss battles in this dungeon right at the end, both of which are nicely creative. Firstly, Wiggly Worms. Why Wiggly Worms got to go big boss mode, I don't know, but I can always appreciate firing rifle rounds at floppy long things. So this has multiple targets that pop out of the ground, and just like my dad's advice to me as a teenager, you're gonna want to spread your load a bit. Because if you take one out, the others will get bigger. The more you take out, 
the bigger the other ones will get. So it's best to get them all within an inch of their lives before finishing them off. Otherwise, the final one will be quite tough to face off against, you know, with full health. And despite just beating that boss, the game isn't giving you much relief. Sure, you can head back to the payphone and save, but the very next screen is the second boss. And you guessed it, you've caught up with her. I'm not quite sure how events unfolded to make it be that you're on the back of a tiny carriage drawn by flaming horses rampaging through the park, but it's a pretty epic visual nonetheless. And the inventive thing about this battle is that you literally have no room to fart. There is barely any space to move and dodging attacks is super difficult. But as long as you keep your health topped up and you've been spending your bonus points on your armor and weapons, you should be good. At the end of the battle, Eve reveals Aya was purposely drawn towards the opera and that they both share a power. And if they join forces, together they can rule the galaxy as father and son. Oh wait, that's a different movie. But she offers to join forces anyway. Aya is like, what are you talking about? And then the carriage crashes. We cut back to Daniel who's helpless about his family and Aya, but some good news finally. His son runs up to him saying he left because he had a sickly feeling in his stomach. But his mum, Daniel's ex-wife, is dead. Back at the station, they are reeling from all the death. Aya is missing and Daniel is determined to find her, leaving his son in the hands of the officers letting him make friends with the police dogs. Meanwhile, Manhattan is evacuated. We then cut to someone completely new. With the road sealed, this Japanese dude called Maeda wants to go to the station, but they won't let him in. The officers confront him, with even one dude mocking his English level and tells him to go back to Beppu. But the moment the racism exits his mouth, he starts being engulfed in flames. Even the mitochondria know a scumbag when they see one. At least they don't discriminate. They'll kill anyone, no matter the color of their skin. But yeah, rather hilariously, while the cop is toasting, Maeda just casually sneaks past the barrier. Aya eventually wakes up in a crack den with a strange Japanese man by her side. The dark side of sex tourism, ladies and gentlemen. Oh no, wait, it's that man Maeda. He's a Japanese scientist who's familiar with a similar incident that happened back in Japan years ago. And he came to give his advice to the police. This gives the whole backstory of the original story. Because yeah, Parasite Eve was actually a Japanese novel. A similar incident happened in Japan and that's detailed in that book. This video game is pretty much a sequel to that book. Not that anyone who played would know that in the West, but it's a neat touch that there's a whole origin story out there. Where liver cells of a scientist's wife were cultivated to eventually take over the body and then try to give birth to an ultimate being to destroy humanity. Maybe something like that is happening here. And Aya starts to doubt herself. Why is she the only one not affected? Is she a monster waiting to happen too? Will she be another Melissa? She reveals that when she was touched by Eve, she had a feeling of Maya. Maya was Aya's sister. Yeah, they could have changed the names a little bit. Maya and Aya. I'm going to call her Maya from now on, okay? Aya and Maya. And Maya died in a car crash many, many years ago with their mother. After conveniently raiding the local pharmacy and gun shop to stock up on supplies, you decide to head to the museum because Maeda wants to run some tests on equipment that Dr. Clamp should have. He inspects the cells of Eve and combines it with his own blood. And we can see Eve attacks his cells, managing to take over as such. He claims this kind of mitochondria isn't like normal mitochondria. Hers is a highly evolved form. As a comparison, Aya wants to test herself to see if she is like Eve. But no, in fact, her cells manage to fight Eve's off. 
Clamp interrupts and instead of calling the cops for trespassing, he talks with the cops and sees that Aya's cells are very unique. But before he can find out more information, Daniel interrupts as he sees his kid and wife's name on Clamp's computer. He starts going all old school on his ass as one would. And before anyone can actually explain anything of true value, you are forced to leave. Because we're not going to tell you all the plot right now. Even though we could, we still need to save some nuggets for later on. So it turns out their names were part of a HLA list, which shows if transplants will be compatible with someone. The mystery deepens. If only they had beaten the shit out of that doctor, the whole thing would be known by now. We wouldn't need five more hours of this game. When you arrive back at the station, the place is trashed. It's wrecked. Officers are either dead or wounded, and we don't know what's going on. But it is probably Eve. But Daniel, once again going apeshit, runs after his son, who you might remember was busy playing with the doggos. This place is infested with both old and new enemies, like these spiders who spit webs on the floor, which makes movement even more sluggish than it normally is, if you find that believable. These are actually really dangerous, and I admittedly almost fell to them once or twice. There are even some werewolf-type creatures in here. Your first port of call will be to the weapons place, where you can see the anti-gun weapon expert dying. That's what you get for being a pacifist, sucker. Anyways, Wayne will take over their job. Then you want to probably go check on the brat with the dogs, and he's missing alongside the dog. Sadly, it's not a heroic feat by the dog rescuing the kid out of harm's way. No, the dog is leading him into harm's way. This ain't no good doggo anymore. Battling your way through the police station, it's nice to see it wrecked. It's a cool before and after scenario. And I think I have to say, this might be the most difficult part of the game for me. Enemies weren't exactly generous with medicine drops, and the space you have to fight in here is so, so small. These cops are on a budget, they can't afford wide, open plan workspaces, tiny corridors with no room to breathe. It's actually quite a short dungeon, but it feels much longer. You're chasing after the kid and the dog called Shiva. I don't know why she's leading him away to rip his face off instead of just doing it straight away. Maybe she feels he deserves some dignity in dying alone. Who knows? You chase them to the top of the building, pretty much, where even before you arrive, the chief jumps in and tells Ben to get away. Ben has no idea what's going on because, you know, it's a cute doggo. You just want to pet and cuddle it until it transforms into a three-headed monster. I'm guessing pedigree chum won't be enough anymore. Thankfully, you arrive just in time before both are killed, and it's time to put Shiva down. You have to take out all three heads. I think each one has a special attack, so it's best to take them down one by one, rather than spreading your load this time around. Spreading your load on a dog is never advisable. That's a fine and a suspended sentence at minimum. With those two safe but the chief mildly wounded, Daniel is now in charge for a while. Maeda asks the most random of questions, is there a sperm bank around here? I know he's not had much time to crack one off since he landed from Japan, and I appreciate the notion of not wanting any wastage, but now's probably not the time, Maeda. He's worried that Eve's body is going to expire soon, and she needs to give birth to an ultimate being before she does. Bizarrely, Daniel is aware of a doctor in the local hospital who specializes in artificial insemination. I'm not going to question it. But for the first and only time in video games, we must utter the phrase, To the sperm bank! Without context, it sounds like a parody, but we are genuinely heading to the hospital to blow up some spunk before an evil being can inseminate herself. They don't make them like they used to. For day four, we end up in the hospital. Maeda has gone with us for some reason, even though he can't go in due to the threat of being burned alive. But before that, he gives more lowdown on what happened in Japan. 
The ultimate being there died because of a rebellion from the male cells of the father that was used to inseminate the Eve. If that's not toxic masculinity, I don't know what is. This hospital is the next dungeon. Again, it's fairly short, but feels longer. The premise is that you need to get to the sperm higher up in the building, but as you step into the elevator, Eve sabotages it and sends you down to the basement. In the process, cutting the power and destroying the stairs. So this, I would say, is the most puzzling element of Parasite Eve. Not that it throws anything major at you, but you need to explore the basement, find a bunch of fuses and pop them in the breaker or fuse box, whatever you call them. I like this place a lot because it definitely gives the most horror vibes from the entire game. Going into the morgue and stuff, it is quite creepy and atmospheric. Ample usage of Dutch angles. I'd actually go and say it's my favorite part of the game because it is it's quite a bit slower. There's more exploration, not a linear path you have to follow. She keeps seeing Maya, her deceased sister. Here especially, for some reason, Aya takes it as almost like she's really seeing like a real person, seeing that she must be cold wearing so few clothes. You even end up in the room that you keep getting flashbacks about, which is, a, you know, still pretty unclear about what's going on. This is also one of the very few times you see civilians, still alive at least. Parasite Eve is quite a lonely game, but you do come across a patient and a few healthcare professionals. A doctor tells you that in the storage area, there is a tank to control liquid nitrogen, which is used to stop the sperm going rank. So you have to turn that off first before heading to the bank itself. Once you arrive and having staved off the increasingly big monsters, you'll find a lot of notes on the ground, which you know what that means, exposition time. Alongside the patient list, Aya spots her mother's name, Mariko Brea. Remember, she's half Japanese. Dead alongside one of her daughters, Maya Brea. On the very same day they are pronounced dead, a girl called Melissa Pierce was given a life-saving operation. Hmm. As this is going on, elsewhere on an aircraft carrier, the US Navy has had enough of this crap and is sending in fighter jets to see what the hell is going on. On the roof, there's no Eve yet, but a giant frigging spider with a huge brain for a body. And this would be a difficult fight if you didn't have so much damn space to give it the runaround. This is once again a two-part fight that I found quite easy. I used haste to speedy Gonzales away from the spitting webs. Eventually, the poor thing falls through the roof and finally you get to see Eve. She's got the sperm and she's learned from the mistakes of the previous incident in Japan. It's not going to fail this time. As the fighter jets so rudely interrupt their little talk, she liquefies them and blows them up. That's a pretty hardcore death right there. All it needed was a shark gobbling up the wreckage and that would be the most metal death ever. A second jet is about to crash on the roof and you need to leg it. I don't know if you can genuinely die here if you don't find the escape place fast enough, but I wasn't about to try. As easy as the boss was, I don't fancy doing it again. You jump on the window cleaning machine or whatever they're called, and after a rather unwelcome fight, you just about stop it in time before you crash to the ground. On the car ride back to the station, you find out that Clamp was fired from the hospital back in the day for selling patients list to the black market. And it turns out that before she fully turned, Melissa was seen meeting Clamp in the museum. The plan is to find them both before the ultimate being can be born. However, instead of going to the logical place of the museum, you decide to just, just look around the city. It's Manhattan, how big can it be? We've got three people looking for her. We are in to day five, and this is by far the longest day so far. You'll be going all over the place today, and pretty much having the most difficult and weirdest day of your life thus far. And that's saying a lot considering you fought a giant spider on top of a sperm bank. That'll be a nice story to tell the grandkids. Mommy, what's a sperm bank? When it's daytime, you'll see two new locations on the map. There's a warehouse and Chinatown. How and why you would go there, who knows? 
As far as I know, no one told you Jack. You're just brilliant at sensing Eve, I guess. Aya is always drawn towards her. There you go, I fixed your plot hole game. The warehouse is a side quest that's not really important to the plot. It's a small dungeon where you fight a giant enemy crab who's got a penchant for bubble beam. And here you get a rocket launcher, which uh, I never used. But the real place is Chinatown. This consists of a long ass road full of fox-like monsters. You don't spend much time here, which is a pity because it's always visually appealing seeing all the shop signs and things like that. Sadly, at the end of the road, you meet Maeda. And you end up jumping into the sewers. Again, a double sewer whammy. That is a brave move from the devs. Let's see if it pays off. I actually think Jackie Chan's Stuntmaster may have taken some inspiration from this game because it flows like kind of the same way you start in the sewers before transitioning into the subway. But we're getting ahead of ourselves because we have to talk about the enemies here. Bats, probably one of the most annoying enemies in this game because of course they are, they're bats, it's almost destiny. These ones throw out a beam that causes darkness slash blindness, whatever you want to call it, meaning your range is awful and you pretty much have zero chance of hitting anything until it wears off or you use an item called Cure D. Yeah, Aya wants to cure the D. Didn't realize she was batting for the other team. Rather conveniently, you'll have more Cure D than you know what to do with since the enemies that blind you also carry the cure and you'll be picking up loads. Way too much Cure D. Curing that D. And I'm not even going to talk about curing the P. Yeah, all about curing the DP, whatever. I don't know what I'm talking about, it's too much. This sewer place is an absolute maze. It's super confusing and easy to get lost since it's just a huge grid with no direction. You just have to end up in the right place until you find something a bit more structured. You follow the maple syrup, remember from Central Park? Yeah, this goo is them and they're in the water system. You can't let that happen for some reason. Pressing a few buttons and something happens. I don't know what. I guess it's fine now since you're in the subway where you end up fighting another unique boss. This time a centipede which splits itself apart and does a little dance around you. And as you exit the subway you find a dead cop. But you look over the waters and suddenly it clicks. The museum! Why did we think of that earlier? That could have saved us at least an hour of time. Oh well, at least we saved the city's water supply, I think, even though there's no one here to drink it. Disc 2. Yeah, what a place to end the first disc. It seems the CGI cutscenes have been catching up with us. It's time to visit the museum again. This is like the third time. Can never visit enough. Good job it's free. This is a super cool place. I'd actually like to visit it myself, although something tells me inside it doesn't actually look like this. You spot Clamp walking away and you give chase. This game's all about chasing people. And it's all going fine and dandy until Velociraptors start attacking you. I guess they wanted to do Dino Crisis even before Capcom. And let me tell you, of all the Smegheads in this game, these are truly the worst. They are strong, quick, and genuinely, I still don't know how to deal with them in the best way possible because they're just too quick and seemingly unavoidable. Even with haste boosting Aya, it doesn't last long enough to make the most of it. And this place is full to the absolute brim with them. And that's not all that's waiting here because there's also giant scorpions and armadillo things. Those scorpions can do one as well because they, yeah, this is when you need the pee. You need to cure the pee. But thankfully, there's only like three or four of them, not dozens. The gimmick to this dungeon here is to answer quiz questions. There are a lot of question stands which ask you ridiculous stuff that were probably very off the cuff mentions throughout the game or just completely pulled from their backsides. The end goal is just to get to Clamp, having to take the long way around to his office. As you deactivate the alarm, you let the security barriers go up. On a monitor, you spot Eve, heavily pregnant. And as you exit, you see the goo from before enveloping the T-Rex skeleton before making it sentient. But we'll deal with that later because we need to head to Clamp now. And inside his office, we see Maeda. Oh yeah, I'm sure this dude has been fighting off all the raptors and scorpions to get in here. Of course he has. He says he wanted to test something, but also gives you a special gun that he conveniently puts off telling you for what purpose other than 
It might be useful. He'll explain more later. Yeah, I love it when people do that. I have something really important to tell you, but I'm going to tell you later. But for now, he tells you that Clamp was cultivating the liver cells of your late sister, Maya, and also creating artificial sperm. Sperm without the naughty, naughty masculine stuff inside of it. Sperm that will be able to successfully create the ultimate being. Clamp shows his face and laughs at Aya's attempt to put him under arrest. He's gone full psycho and attempts to stab Aya before Daniel busts in and takes him down. Clamp is done. He's done what he needs to do and calls on Eve to smite him. Daniel and Maeda jump out of the second floor window to avoid being crispy too, as you do. But Aya is fine, of course, it doesn't affect her. You grab his key and try to find Eve. Finish her off before she can give birth. Now, I'm not saying I condone shooting pregnant ladies, but uh, I think, I think it might be justified here. Not before you get thrown into the lion's den, however. This is perhaps the most memorable boss of the game because, you know, it's a T-Rex. But by this point, I'd learned the strongest magic attack in the game. Usually you won't get it until after this fight, but due to getting a bit lost and having to fight a few more monsters than normal, I got Liberate beforehand to absolutely annihilate the T-Rex. It really wasn't much of a fight. And this game becomes almost a joke now. It's kind of like Cloud having Omni Slash or Knights of the Round. You'll find Eve's nest and just like any pregnant lady, comfort before modesty is the most important thing. Who cares about social norms? If you need to get your <clears throat> out, then you get your <clears throat> To be fair, there is no nipples, so it's not sexual in any kind of way. It's just like she's wearing a spandex suit. That's it. It's a sexual Star Trek. In order to get away, she summons a giant maple syrup man, who I think is due for a scene in the next Ghostbusters movie, and he takes her to safety. Once again, you have to go after her. And Daniel is pissed because his ex-wife is part of that blob thing. Not only did she leave him, not only did she ruin his life, but now she's a giant blob terrorizing New York. And I bet, I bet she still gets alimony. It turns out that the game decides to tell you a bit more important information from Daniel and Maeda, like they've been hiding it all along. It turns out that Melissa, long ago, got a kidney transplant from Maya, Aya's sister, after she passed away. And Clamp was there to witness it. He knew Maya's kidney cells were special. Maya's special kidney then took over Melissa's body, and the medicine that Melissa started taking from Clamp acted more as a catalyst for it to happen. All of this is happening thanks to your sister's evil kidney. Meanwhile, the Navy, not wanting the Ghostbusters to take all the credit, send in an attack team to destroy it, which is of course annihilated. In fact, they can't get close enough. The only one who can get close is Aya. And so you are ordered aboard the Nimitz before it was famous for UFO sightings, and the Admiral there asks you to do a flyover to Eve by yourself and detonate a nuclear bomb. In the goofiest writing of all, the nuke can only be shot from short range and not to worry about flying because their choppers can go on autopilot. There are more holes than Swiss cheese, but this is when Parasite Eve stops the pretense and becomes gloriously dumb. All the other choppers are downed and even though they can program the chopper to fly in extreme formation by itself, Aya must be there to press a button to launch the nuke. The Statue of Liberty gets more than it anticipated, but it's still not enough. Eve is still Eve, even if the blob is down. Aya goes full action hero. Eve has this big speech that boils down to the usual cliche of humans are basically parasites too, we're not so different from one another, civilization needs a restart, let's fight. She has two forms, the first is easy enough, but the second, well she's fast as hell and it's almost impossible to keep her in range of your bullets. But a couple of liberates and she will be down.
Here you meet with Daniel and Maeda as they bask in the victory. Even Wayne came from the station to see you and he congratulates you by giving you the chance to engrave a name onto one of your weapons and one of your armors, preferably the one you're using and a good one. I call mine Jesse and James, but this is important because whichever you name, that will be the only thing that carries over into New Game Plus, so choose wisely. As you'd expect, victory is not certain, because the baby was born after all. Battleships blowing up and it's a disaster. The ultimate being is here. And it's a baby boy, so of course, is a bit of a knob. Everyone flees but Aya, who knows that she's the only one who can take care of it. Maeda tries to give you something, but is pulled away by Daniel. This is truly the final fight. All four forms of it, from a baby all the way up to a Dragon Ball Z character. This final form is almost impossible. In fact, I think it is impossible. Bullets do almost zero damage and you're taking hits very easily. That is until after a period, it cuts to Daniel and Maeda in the chopper. And it's told that Maeda was trying to give Aya some special bullets that were infused with Aya's DNA, something which is super effective against Eve's cells. How bloody convenient. And Daniel does something super badass. With these new science bullets, shooting it does an incredible amount of damage and it will be over for good. Or is it? Because the game has one final dick move for you. An escape sequence. One that's really, really easy to mess up because you're not sure which direction you need to go in. And I tell you, this blob don't hang around. If you don't save, you will probably have to do all those boss fights again. As you run through the ship, and get to the exit, the boat self-destructs and it's probably over. Aya questions why she had such power and Maeda conveniently tells her it's because she has part of her sister in her too. Her eyeball, of course. Yes, she had her sister's eye transplanted into her. So why didn't she go apeshit stealing sperm and duffing herself up? Well, because the cells in her went along a different evolutionary path, the peaceful path, or something. This Maeda fella, he is so damn convenient. The game ends where it began, back at the opera. This time, Aya, Maeda, Daniel and his son decide to close the chapter off by seeing the play that started it all. But something may not be as it seems. Cliffhanger! And there we have it, Parasite Eve done in seven and a half hours. Well, kinda, but I'll get to that point in a minute. Now I can see there's gonna be some complaints about the length of this game. It's technically a JRPG and seven hours, eight at a push, is mind-blowingly short, especially for an era when anything less than 30 was looked at like it just spat on your shoes. On the other hand, perhaps there's some replayability? Well, no, not really. Due to the linear nature and the chapter structure, there's very little wiggle room for trying something different or new. I would say most JRPGs lack any sort of replayability outside of pure love for the story and wanting to experience it again. And those that do have mechanics that help keep it fresh a second or third time through often have side effects, perhaps an unfocused story or lack of world immersion. With games like Final Fantasy or Suikoden, you could argue that a second playthrough with different party members is a small but adequate change up to give something different. Parasite Eve, well, Aya isn't a party girl. She's all alone in this adventure, so that's another nail in its coffin. 
And perhaps Square realized that and decided it needed a meaty endgame. And that's where EX mode comes in. While it's not exactly brimming with story, nor does it flow well with the rest of the game, this provides almost double the amount of content that the main game does. And adding the cherry on top, you need this for the true ending of the game. Yes, I did not show you the true ending of the game. Yet. On New Game Plus, loading up your completed file, it will unlock the Chrysler Building. Sadly, it's not for touristic purposes, it's to murder more monsters. And this is where the game almost turns into a dungeon crawler. It's a completely different game. As you all know, or as Wikipedia told me, the Chrysler Building has 77 floors, and Parasite Eve emulates that. This has you exploring all 77 floors. It doesn't replicate the layout out of each and every floor, but each time you enter, the floors are randomly generated, most of them. Even items are random. And this is an absolute test of your endurance. By far and away, the most difficult thing the game has thrown at you thus far, and you're probably not going to be prepared to jump in straight away as soon as you boot up New Game Plus. I guess I better talk about the New Game Plus briefly before we get into the Chrysler meat. In terms of the New Game Plus, what you get to keep is pretty significant. Right before the final boss, when Wayne lets you engrave a name on one weapon and armor, you will take these into New Game Plus, meaning that you'll start the game with comically overpowered weaponry, at least if you engrave something meaningful. If you've been boosting its stats over the course of the game, you'll be laughing your way to the end credits once again in no time at all. Aya herself goes back to level 1, and even if you use bonus points on her personal stats, they have gone. It's only really the weapon and armor that you carry over. But even with being back to level 1, you'll still be in beast mode with the weapons that kill in 1, and armor that means enemies deal 0 damage to you. The difficulty is ramped up a little bit. You'll notice that enemies tend to be more numerous than before, where once you had to fight 2 snakes, now there are 3. But they die in one shot anyways, cares. Despite this, you are going to want to get pretty far in the main game again before you attempt the Chrysler building, because even though the enemies are manageable on the lower levels right from the off, you just won't have enough resources to last. You're going to need enormous amounts of ammo, which you just won't have from the beginning of the game. You're probably going to want to wait till the fourth or fifth day of the game before you attempt getting anywhere in this absolute beast of a dungeon. 77 floors of randomly generated wankishness. These floors are never small either. You could be like 10, 15, 20 minutes or more on each one. Depends how lost you get. It's randomly generated but has stock pieces put together. And with no map to help out, it's very easy to be snow blinded by seeing the same screen over and over again get lost, especially with all the dead ends that pop up here. And it's also really harsh. Unlike a real dungeon crawler, if you die here, it still acts like you die in the main game. Like, it's seriously game over, man. Reload your save. And unless you want to walk down, there is no way to escape this place except every 10 floors. You fight a boss, which gives you a key to reach that said floor again. For example, you beat the boss on the 10th floor, then you can use the elevator to go up and down up to level 10. When you defeat the boss on the 20th floor, you can then go from 11 to 20. You can go back and save if you want to. So even if you're well equipped and more than capable of taking on the 10 floor slog between keys and then a boss, you're looking at like an hour or more for each. And God forbid you get to the 7th floor and decide you don't have what it takes, then you're buggered. It's just a really long walk back down. Depending on when and how you decide to tackle the Chrysler building, this will probably double the length of the game. As I said, the floors are randomly generated and populated with monsters which get stronger the higher you go up. You'll find rather delicious items here as well, interesting weapons, tools and armor, but perhaps not as strong as the weapons you've already beefed up. As someone who is hoping for a shorter experience after tackling two huge RPGs in a row, Parasite Eve was supposed to be the lighter experience for me. But yeah, the EX mode makes it almost as long as Suicoden 2. But it's not story heavy, so that saved me a bit of time. But it was definitely very important, at least for me, to do it, especially if I'm going to check out the rest of the series. Because the true ending only occurs when you get to the top and defeat the final boss. I've always got to show you the best ending, at least try it. Was it worth it? 
probably not for me in producing timely YouTube content for my dear subscribers and patrons, uh, but you know, for an average gamer in 1998, it's an interesting way to extend the length of the game. It's practically two games in one because they're so vastly different from one another, and boy does it provide a challenge, something to really extend the longevity. I don't know if I enjoyed it though, because it's one hell of a slog. A lot of the same kind of things for hours and hours and hours, I don't really recommend it. If only it had a couple of usual genre staples just to help a dude out, like an auto-drawn map as you walk around, that would have done wonders for my sanity. And perhaps like an uncommon item, like a, an escape rope to help you bail out if you had enough of the 38th floor or something. Like your mum tells you your dinner's ready, you gotta have her going apeshit leaving electronics on. Get out, save. Just those two additions would have made it a really nice experience. And perhaps a lot more diversity in the map pieces that randomly make up each floor. I know it's a corporate building, so you're not going to have like unique ecosystems every 10 floors, but at least a change of wallpaper, that wouldn't have gone amiss. Although saying that, it would have been awesome to see the environment slowly become more and more deranged the further you climb to the top. That only happens like in the last seven floors. Why couldn't that happen like all the way through? Or have at least one segment be a funky disco scene? Is that too much to ask? Anyways, what's the story about Lamori? What's at the top of the tower? What is the true ending of the game? Well, just in case Eve and the ultimate being failed, a true bred Eve was created at the top of this building as a backup measure. She appears in the form of Maya, your sister, who for a brief moment, her true conscious self appears and has an emotional moment with Aya. She's very confused as the last thing she remembers is riding in the car just before her death. But the moment is cut short because true bred Eve is going to kill you. And holy crap, she's going to kill you. This is an almost impossible boss if you don't have a boatload of revives in your inventory. She can one hit kill you and she has an endless amount of health and if you attack her while she has Maya drifting around, she will automatically heal. And the more times you do this, the more effective the heal can be. I did not realize this the first time of trying, which ended up making the fight impossible. But the second time, after being very, very careful about when I shot, eventually she disappeared. That is easily, perhaps, yes, it's definitely the most difficult boss I've ever fought in a game, 100%. And we do get the true ending. Yeah, forget that nonsense in the theater, the true ending is that with Eve wiped out inside Aya, her mitochondria says that she has surpassed the Eve you have just fought. And now it's time for her to take over Aya's body. Betrayal! But then, out comes a voice of Maya. From you. So, inside this one brain, we've got Aya, we've got Maya, and we've got this new Eve. Three voices in one head. And it is mildly confusing. But after a battle of will, the Eve is expelled. Aya seemingly becomes back to normal. No freaky powers anymore. Her mitochondria have given up, except she still has Maya's voice inside her head as the two walk out of the tower together. That was not worth 10 hours of climbing to the top of the tower. And there we have it. Finally, Parasite Eve is done. I promise it's really done now. And I have to say, what a really unique, interesting experience. I've never played anything quite like it. Well, okay, I've played games that have small parts of what Parasite Eve has, but not smashed together into one package. And while I'm not going to go overboard and say it's one of my favorite games ever, it is a bloody good time and an essential game in anyone's PlayStation collection. If you have a PS1 collection and you don't have this in it, I, I hope your children laugh at you. So where shall we start to analyze this bad boy? Well, we always start with the story. Now, I'm not going to be one of those ridiculous people that tells you Parasite's Eve story is a masterpiece in horror science fiction because it's not. It is, in fact, very enjoyable, interesting, well worth the experience, but with the caveat of it being both sloppy at times and beautifully dumb. The original novel, on which this game is almost like a sequel to, 
I have no idea if that's written well or not. I do like the idea of making fiction out of real science, at least real science words we may be vaguely familiar with. The overall premise is great, and I like the fact that it's second part of a story that almost no one in English was aware of at the time. But there's no denying that for a game with such a cinematic focus, it does have its issues in terms of telling you what the hell is going on. Parasite Eve has just as many talky bits and FMVs as it does gameplay, and yet they don't quite have the writing chops to make it a properly solid script. It's hard for me to put into words why, even though I regularly write 35,000 word essays about video games, I'm not the most eloquent or communicative of persons, so uh, I'll try. For me, I have to divide the story between what is currently happening in this moment, the threat, how to deal with it, and then the backstory, like the science behind it and the reason why this is happening and why it's happening to Aya. It's clear that the former is stronger than the latter, and the backstory reveals almost bring it down. And this guy, Maeda, is pretty much to blame for the entire thing. He is Mr. Explano, except he's not particularly good at it, because he only reveals key information when the writer decides they need to add an extra layer of story. Telling you important facts once every hour is quite annoying. I know he's here on a consultancy basis, so he's making the most out of his hourly fees. I mean, I can't blame the fella. I'd do the same. And he's also the deus ex machina dude. Somehow predicting that the ultimate being would need a special type of gun with a special type of ammo that he obviously couldn't tell Aya about beforehand. He's supposed to be the expert here, but whenever he explains something, you just get the feeling he's mostly been hiding stuff from you. I don't know if that's just the vibe I get. And when he is on the money about something, it's just overly convenient. I think the game would have been better without his appearance, in all honesty, if Aya and Daniel could have figured this stuff out for themselves, rather than him popping in once in a while to tell you something he should have told you three hours ago. I'd have preferred that. I think if the story was structured better, it could have been a lot more effective. As I said, what is here is good. It's dumb, but good. The backstory connection to the current events is fascinating. It's just not told particularly well. A few tweaks here and there could have made it brilliant. Maybe a second draft wouldn't have gone amiss, Mr. Takita. And I don't want to sound like I'm completely down on the story because I know it's well liked. I just can't help but see the potential it could have had. It could have been a masterpiece. A masterpiece of schlock, of course. Having mitochondria use humans as a host in a parasitical way before they could evolve into an unstoppable power, it's quite a neat idea. Taking the simple, shallow statement that mitochondria are the engine rooms of the cell and enhancing that to mean that they can set people on fire, it's wonderfully fun, dumb concept. Aya's history is good with it too. Aya's and her sister Maya both having a connection to Eve is neat. Convenient, of course, but it's explained that Aya is subconsciously drawn into this drama due to her connection with her sister, who, let's not forget, is residing within Melissa. The opera singer, thanks to the haunted kidney. And oddly, within Aya's eyes too. Uh, I'm still processing that part. It's almost like destiny as the sisters come together, each with an evolved mitochondria that went separate ways. One sister got the powerful but symbiotic one, and the other wanted to destroy the world. I think we've all got siblings like that. I'm quite a fan of science fiction stories, especially ones grounded in some kind of reality like this as you fight reincarnated T-Rexes, and I was definitely dying to know how the pieces fitted together. And I came out satisfied, if lamenting the fact that if Mr. Takita sent me a draft in 1997, I'm pretty sure I could have done a tremendous job in making it a tighter narrative. But you know how game devs were back in the 90s, so close-minded wouldn't send a script to a seven-year-old Northern English kid. <sighs> Things like claiming everyone died in the opera scene, but it's also claimed Aya's date ran away like a wuss. So did he die? Why is Daniel taking the piss out of him? It's implied Daniel's son only has him to call family, when in fact we learn about Daniel's wife, ex-wife, but it's still family, right? It's small, sloppy things like this that also make you doubt whether the main story is airtight or not. Are there contradictions here or there? Maybe, maybe not, but you'll definitely distrust it a little bit. And usually, I'm not one for messing around too much with a classic, but if Parasite Eve was to receive a remake, which it should square, it should, one of the things I would advise changing up a little bit is how the story is told, and, you know, of course, making the script a bit clearer. Keep it dumb, of course, keep it dumb, but, you know, refine it.
I love the idea of the story unfolding day after day. It makes it feel like episodes of a TV show. Each day is something different happening as the incident escalates to its climax. Even just the wording makes it better because let's face it, they are chapters, but I don't really enjoy having chapters, especially in JRPGs, but making them actual days. It just instantly makes the concept fine. It's funny how like change of wording and integration makes it so much better. If I was a TV executive, I would be tempted to get Square Enix on the phone and make this a miniseries because it's almost perfect for the format. You could not have done this 10 to 15 years ago because you can't have this dragged on for 22 episodes, but like six or seven? Come on, Netflix, do the right thing. You also don't need to change anything to make it more diverse. It's already got everything you need for the quotas. Speaking of characters, whether the game is remade, retranslated or remastered or gets a TV show, don't for the love of God change the characters. Although that may be too late. From what I've sponged about the sequels, it seems like they messed with quite a few of them. Aya, our main protagonist, she's a decent one because she echoes pretty much the player's thoughts, which is collectively, what the smeg is going on? She is equally naive to the situation, and her flashbacks confuse her as much as us, which is nice. You don't feel like she's hiding anything from you just for the sake of a twist later down the line. You are along with her for the journey of discovery. She's quite badass and yet does have her vulnerable moments here and there. She's questioning why she has the superpower to survive the heat and even makes it her responsibility to take her down. Her own flesh and blood pretty much. She is not much of a talker. Daniel and Maeda do most of that, but they are nowhere near as awesome as Aya. You're a little bit worried at the beginning because she's a bit mopey and withdrawn and you think they're getting into the writing practice for Final Fantasy VIII Squall, but thankfully she has a bit of gumption to make her likeable and a fine action hero. She even gets all proper over the top right at the end. Daniel's role in the story is kind of all over the place because he offers just a little bit of everything that stops him being pigeonholed in an easily definable way for YouTube essayists out there. He's part comic relief, part badass wingman, he is the man who has the most at stake. He also has the most tragedy involved in the plot. Unless you count the murder of hundreds of civilians, and even worse, the death of a mutated dog. But of the core cast, you know, he has his ex-wife perish in a gooey mess right in front of his son's eyes, who he's also desperate to protect. He's also the character we know the most about. He's the most open of the lot of them. We know he's a workaholic, which has affected his personal life. He has the most personality out of everyone, perhaps even erring on stereotypical, no-nonsense cops, rather brash, impulsive, and being the finest bull in the china shop. Compared to the other two main characters, Daniel is probably the one we relate to the most. Aya is nice, but perhaps a bit too quiet, while Maeda is just too nerdy even for nerds. Daniel's just out there spitting out what we're all thinking. Unabashed ranting! It's quite wonderful, even if he does end up doing more harm than good. And let's not forget his bravery right at the end. It's not often I get emotional about a fat dude jumping out of a chopper, but damn, this actually almost made me choke. And weirdly enough, it was the most emotional part of the whole game for me. Forget the tragedy of burning people alive, about Melissa being cultivated as a monstrous being, this guy jumping out of a chopper, not only to potential death down below, but also being toasted alive just so he can give Aya the weapon she needs to kill the ultimate being. He's the true hero, goddammit. It's kind of clever, though I guess. He knows he will survive the burning because of the drink below. I didn't know that was a thing. In that case, why aren't they all greased up in fire retardant lube? Or whatever it's called. Maeda, I've talked about him already. He's probably the weakest important character in the game. He's only here for explanation, which happens in a slightly annoying way. He doesn't really add much in terms of human emotion, whether you feel happy or sad or you laugh with him or at him. You don't really get any of that with this dude. Literally, the only thing that mildly pleased me was when the police officer was emoliated and he just casually sneaks past him. Th that is quite funny, but probably tells you more about me than my Ada. I do like that there's connection to past events that were shown in the original novel. It actually made me intrigued to know that we're in sort of a part two of the story already. And he does provide that fascination, but that's about it. It doesn't help that the script doesn't know where to stand with his language proficiency. He either can barely get out basic sentences or he's blasting out reams of scientific gibberish. It's hard to get a good grasp on this dude. And again, you kind of feel like he's always hiding something. I don't know what it is. 
but I never really trusted him, which is definitely not what the developers were going for. They wanted him to be the audience connection dude. You know, he's Japanese, he knows the law, he's a foreign guy in America. But from my perspective, I just didn't know how to take him. And those are the three main characters in the game. But then you have your bad guys, mainly Clamp, because he's called Clamp. It's like having an enemy called Dr. Bolgag. At least it's not called Dr. Stirrups or something. Ooh. His motivations aren't truly known. All we really do know is that he's a rather clever bugger. But aside from that, why does he want to destroy the world, including himself? Because the old humanity sucks angle will never work for me. The only theory I have is that, firstly, he only started out as a mildly weird misanthrope, as we all were in our teenage years. If you're not caught stealing a list of human leukocyte antigen compatible patients for the black market, were you really a teenager? HLA lists, Snickers from the local off license, it's the same thing. Perhaps he initially cultivated Eve's liver cells for curiosity's sake. But after his reprimand and moving towards research in the museum rather than the hospital, Melissa or Eve found him and put him under her spell which probably consisted of the precise, complicated technique of showing her tits. Powerful spell for any nerd. I don't think we can entirely blame him for his crazed determination to bring forth the apocalypse. Eve looks like she's packing. Could have been anyone. And then there is Eve or Melissa. It's quite important to separate these two because they are different. Melissa is an innocent human. Eve is an evil possessed cell, hell bent on destroying humanity. One probably should get more sympathy than the other. And considering I heard Melissa enjoys watching Love Island, she gets what she deserves. Okay, maybe not, but Melissa really is the unfortunate one here. She's a victim as much as anyone. A double victim, in fact. First, she has organ failure, and her transplant ends up being a haunted kidney. That's just bad luck. She's like a guinea pig, taking medication that actually weakens her immune system, allowing Eve to take over. And to be fair, you can't really blame Eve either. She's just a weird life form that doesn't really know any better. Empathy isn't built into her, just like it isn't built into a shark before it takes a chunk out of your abdomen. You can't put human expectations on cell-based psychopaths. All you can do is make it go extinct. Survival of the fittest and survival of the most well-armed. I'm sure that nuclear bomb helped out in some capacity. And there are the characters, the ones you'll be getting to know the most. A small set, I'm sure you'll agree, but it works well for the runtime of the game, seven hours or so. You don't want a huge set of characters itching for screen time. And that bleeds into the gameplay as well, because for an RPG, boy is Parasite Eve something different. At least from the games that I've played, and at least from ones that are still in my memory. Firstly, let's talk about the battle system, because it's what I find the most interesting. It's got that classic active time battle system that people are more familiar with in Final Fantasy, which mixes both turn-based and real-time mechanics. Having a one-party system is a brave move. Not many are willing to go down that line, especially during this era of the genre. Not having six or seven potential party members in a turn-based RPG is very interesting because it does have the potential to get very boring very quickly. Parties are primarily the driving force in adding a variety of tactics and replayability. So if you're going to go solo, you better make up for those deficiencies. And I don't think Parasite Eve does, which is weird because I still really like it because you're essentially doing the same thing over and over again it's very rare you change up your tactics from the start of each battle you wait pick your target and shoot rinse and repeat balancing your health is really important because enemies can hit hard if you're not well equipped and then you have your special powers but really they don't add a whole lot to proceedings and aside from heal and the occasional use of haste and of course the final big daddy spell i didn't really use them that much the once in a blue moon occasion when I thought, oh, I might try slow or confuse on the enemy, they didn't work. So the only real thing to keep me on my toes was the enemy attack patterns. Because really, you do have to think about the best way to avoid the enemy's attacks. It's not easy, mostly because Aya runs like the entire floor is made of candy apples. Sticky as hell. Her movement is sluggish. The enemies, oh, they're not. I guess Velociraptors evolved candy resistant feet. So you really have to work out the best way to tackle these dinos, the bats, the polar bears. They each have a different way for you to get out of their way. And that's part of the fun. By the time you've played through the game once, you're likely to be a master of dodging these buggers. Well, except for the raptors who are seemingly impossible to avoid. 
Aside from casting haste, I have no idea how to take these knobs down efficiently. So you're just dodging and taking pot shots. And essentially, somehow, a battle system that on the surface level, when describing it, sounds kind of boring, it's not. It's actually very enjoyable. I guess sometimes in life, the simple things are the best. Perhaps it's the fact that battles aren't egregiously common. For a start, they're not random battles, not really anyways. They are predetermined, you just can't see them walking around. You're destined to have a fight when the game decides it. And there are not that many of them, at least in comparison to other examples of the genre, so you're not getting sick of them. Perhaps in the post game with the Chrysler building, fine, but that's really just to extend the length of the game. And as I said previously, it's not really essential. And if you end up getting a bit lost and backtracking places where you shouldn't be, then you can reignite those battles, but usually that's your own choice. Because grinding isn't necessary either. At no point did I feel the need to battle a few more monsters before taking on a boss or a new area. Now don't get me wrong, plenty of bosses put up a challenge and many were won on determination alone. But at no point did I ever feel the need to take a step back and level up. Well, I will make the caveat for the final super duper boss where you need to be tanked up to the absolute maximum. As long as you're on top of things with your weapon, your armor, usage of bonus points, you should be okay. Speaking of those things, I have to say I initially underestimated the importance of your weapons and armor. That's an incredibly dumb thing to say, but hear me out. When it comes to RPGs, I'm mostly used to having one armor set and then dumping it the millisecond a slightly better piece comes along. Either get in the bin or being sold as soon as I'm in a town. That was my initial style when playing Parasite Eve. Same with weaponry. But this game almost rewards sticking with the same equipment unless you come across something substantially better or maybe more your style. I think Parasite Eve kind of undersells the concept of weapon upgrades. The tutorial is kind of half arsed a static blurry screen as a tutorial didn't do much for my imagination and I somewhat ignored it, didn't really get it. And I will say the process of doing it could be made clearer. When I first experimented with it, I wasn't entirely sure what was going to happen if I hit confirm. I was scared I was going to lose my decent weapon. I even did a save state just to see the before and after because I was so worried. The information presented on screen isn't really explicitly clear about what's going to happen. But have faith because this is a vastly useful part of the game. Adding bonus points to your weapon is also very important. Way more important than adding them to Aya stats. But then when you do find the tool item, you definitely want to take advantage of recycling the weapons you don't want. Adding even more bonus stats to the one you're using. For me, this is the true leveling up of the game. This is how you'll make it into the latter stages of the game in a balanced way. If you have two guns, the one you're currently using and another one in your inventory, you can add the bonus points of the one in your inventory to your current one in return for its sacrifice. So you can add one gun to another gun. This is better than using bonus points as well since you can increase a range of stats at the same time. Not only is it the stats, but you can also add special effects onto your guns if they have slots available. Things like acidic rounds, quick draw, and even your armor can have something like instant potion if your health gets too low. This is a brilliant aspect and means you can customize the weapons to your heart's desire. Want a grenade launcher that shoots 10 times the rounds in one attack? That is possible, although highly ill-advised. Yeah, not everything is perfect. Sure, you can have a rifle shooting five times at once, but considering that gun type shoots so slowly, you're going to be a sitting duck before you get through them. You can't cancel mid-action. Personally, I found having a three-shot pistol was great, among some other things like allowing you two actions in one turn, which meant I could use one turn for attacking and then one for topping up my health if need be. It almost felt like I was breaking the game at that point. If you want to add more slots to a weapon, that's where Wayne comes in, if you trade him a card, he will open up a slot on your weapon. A neat idea, but in action, I don't think I found a single trading card in my entire first playthrough. Whether that was just bad luck or they're well hidden, I don't know. But it certainly didn't make me explore this area of the game as much as I should have done. And remember, at the end of the game, when you engrave a weapon and armor, you will take these two things into New Game Plus 
which means if you've been boosting them using bonus points and tools to upgrade them, you will be an absolute beast for round two. One oddity that struck me about Parasite Eve is that there's no economy. And that's not just because Eve made the entire population evacuate. Okay, perhaps that's partly a decent excuse. I just mean there's no way to buy or sell stuff here. That's weird for an RPG, even one as unique as Parasite Eve. There's no money, there's no shops, which uh, I haven't really talked about much yet, but this being partly a horror game, that's frankly the most terrifying thing about it. Forget the mutant dogs, forget being burned alive, you can't buy a cinnamon latte from Starbucks, this is truly the apocalypse. I mean, you can't buy any medicine, you can't buy ammo, both of which are intrinsic to the game. As I said, part of the fun of the battle system is learning how to dodge enemies, but even then, you're going to be sponging a lot of attacks and medicine is necessary. Healing via magic isn't always going to cut it. Same with ammo. You've got guns, but did you know that each shot you take uses one bullet in your inventory? Without being able to buy these, it feels like you have finite resources. It's quite worrying, especially in the first few days. So much so, in your inventory, you are required at all times to keep a baton with you just in case you run out of bullets. Thankfully, the game does eventually become generous with its supply of these things, but they can only be found by item chests or through fighting enemies. Yeah, in order to get more medicine and more ammo, you need to use ammo and probably medicine afterwards. It's weird, and I'll admit to not liking the style at first, but it turns out the developers had their heads screwed on and it didn't make it a chore. The only time I ever ran out of ammo was on New Game Plus, when I jumped straight into the Chrysler building, which was a mistake. Parasite Eve offers a nice variety of dungeons, at least that's what I would call them. Aside from entering the sewers multiple times, you're always in some place new, and they are generally real life locations as well, from Central Park, the museum, such. And while perhaps they don't go one to one with real life locations, it is nice to have them here. My only wish would be the addition of more puzzles, because going back in my head, I almost can't recall any puzzles. There's the knowledge test in the museum, but that's just crazy. And you have to find the fuses in the hospital basement. That's really all I can remember, which is not great. Perhaps that's just the direction they were going for. They wanted it to be mostly action, fast paced. Perhaps they didn't want players getting bogged down trying to solve puzzles. But it's something I love in both RPGs and horror games. So uh, its absence here is a minor disappointment for me. And I guess the pacing is why there are so few opportunities for side quests either. There's literally only two side quests I can think of, three if you count the bonus Chrysler building in New Game Plus. One of them is a small warehouse that's available to go just before you get into Chinatown. As far as I'm aware, it's not really explained why this small dungeon pops up on your map, but it does, and it's a fairly challenging place that doesn't add much to the plot, but you do get a fancy rocket launcher for taking out a giant enemy crab which I found marginally less difficult than this section of the dungeon, on which you're on a narrow gantry and you get absolutely spit-roasted by these two spiders. That's just so cruel. The other side quest, I'm pretty sure is some sort of parody of RPG side quests, like the developers themselves knew how ridiculous or boring some of them could be. The biggest side quest here is collecting trash. Junk. Things one must throw in the bin. And it's not just a little bit. 300. 300 pieces of junk that you can deliver to Wayne. And if you do so, he will create you a super weapon of such. This is a great reward for such an unbearable, painful waste of one's experience. You can only get junk from certain monsters in certain places, and you only have a certain amount of inventory space. So you'll be grabbing like 20 at a time, heading back to the station, dropping them off and coming back, hoping to get the right monsters. I mean, it's hours of grinding. And of course, I didn't do it because I enjoy spending time with my family. It's hard not to think of the developers getting a memo from Square's top brass saying you can't release this without side quests. They didn't want to because they wanted it to be a cinematic experience and they thought they'd poke fun at the idea instead. At least it was a good reward though. Imagine those who collected all the Korok seeds in Breath of the Wild only to get a golden turd. Not that this actually respects your time that much either, but whatever. And that brings me on to my final comment about the gameplay, the inventory. Who knew such an aspect would be such a hot talking point in video games? But apparently, game devs just got a game dev. It's a pain in the arse, to be frank. Weirdly, you get more inventory space the more you level up. 
So at the beginning of the game, you basically have a purse to carry a gun, medicine, armor, and an emergency tampon. Just in case, ladies. It's frankly annoying because even in this first dungeon area, you're gonna run out of space. I don't mind the aspect too much, but they made it a bit of a hassle to deal with, especially when you come across a chest. If you have a full inventory when you open a chest, it will tell you so and ask you what you want to swap out, completely neglecting to tell you what the hell you wanted to swap it for. So you don't know what's in the chest before you swap it for something. You end up swapping medicine for medicine, a crap gun for an even crapper gun. Not the end of the world since you can swap it back and you can even put items in empty chests if you want, but would it have been difficult just to tell you what the item is first? You will constantly be doing this. Now you can upgrade your inventory manually if you want to use bonus points on that instead of your weapons, but there's no point since it doesn't carry over to New Game Plus. It's a waste. And then there's the annoyance of Wayne. I know I've mentioned this dude quite a lot, but his final use in this game is storing items away in the station for later usage. It's fine. But when you want to give him something, you have to manually place it in the storage. It doesn't automatically go to the nearest empty spot. No, you have to click your item, drag it all the way down, going down, 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 and pop it there yourself. And playing with the analog sticks, menu navigation is just a horror show. For some reason, using the analog controls makes the D-pad unusable, which is a shame because I always use D-pads for menu stuff. It just makes sense, but not here, sadly. All right, moving on from the gameplay, let's talk about the presentation. Parasite Eve does an absolutely phenomenal job all around. Obviously, if you're a special kind of person who can't see the beauty of what's presented here for the time, I'm not going to be able to convince you otherwise. But let me tell you, for 1998, this game must have been one of the best lookers around on the PS1. Why? Well, first, let's start with the backgrounds. They are pre-rendered, which means the attention to detail is great. The designers could do almost anything they wanted, not restricted by the PS1's penchant for warping 3D textures like it life depends on it. Unlike most of Square's games of this era, this one is grounded in reality. It's set in a real life location, not like a steampunk dystopia, not in a whimsical fantasy land. No, this is NYC and it's presented wonderfully. Maybe I'm just a fan of pre-rendered backgrounds, but you can't tell me you'd rather explore the sewers in 3D models. Get out! Here we have a visual and directive flair that just wouldn't be possible otherwise. The mood and lighting is spot on, and the place feels far more lived in. I mean, just look at the detective's office, messier than the game shelf behind me. At least seeing this makes me feel like less of a subhuman slob. It even holds up nicely today when blown up on a giant HDTV. Okay, well, maybe not. Not everyone would agree with that statement, but I stand by it. The atmosphere presented is really well done. Then we have the character models, which are, again are brilliant. They are surprisingly huge, and it's quite surprising to know that Parasite Eve and Final Fantasy VII were released just a year apart. With Final Fantasy VII's Lego models on the overworld, there's no comparison. Even the battle models of FF7 can't compete with Parasite Eve. Long-legged, great attention to detail in the animation. It really does have some of the best animation I've seen in a game of this era. The human characters, of course. I don't know for sure, but I would not be surprised to find out that they use mocap techniques. Just paying attention to the opera scene, I was immediately impressed with what I was seeing. They look so natural, at least compared to other games of the era. I know that Parasite Eve was almost a test run for their upcoming development of Final Fantasy VIII, and you can clearly see the influence on character models, but Actually, Parasite Eve is just better looking still. I guess that could be put down to the fact that this game is way smaller in scale, with very few characters, especially in battle. Perhaps they had the time to give it as much love as possible, or maybe keep it within the realms of what was possible on the system. The enemy designs are decent enough, but I think more variety would not have gone amiss. You're often fighting the same things or variations of the same things over the course of the game. But I do approve of the escalation from snakes and birds to goddamn dinosaurs always a good move. Now the CGI cutscenes play an important part in this game and I'm pretty sure it would not have been greenlit without them. They were going all out with the epic action blockbuster experience. It's labelled as a cinematic RPG for a reason. And while they do look a bit rough around the edges because you know that's what happens when 20 years pass but they do a really good job. The attention to detail in some places is really good. I mean just look at that rat. The only real letdown are the humans, but we could say that phrase in any context. The uncanny valley, if the valley was the Mariana Trench. They don't look great, especially with maple syrup coming out of their eyes. It's 
never a pleasant experience. I don't know how you Canadians do it. Just the sheer amount of them is quite exhausting for a PS1 game. I wasn't expecting to have so much CGI. It really adds a lot to the production value, even if they look a bit cheesy now. I'm sure we can all appreciate it for what it was back when it released. The sound, also part of the presentation, is equally awesome. The soundtrack to Parasite Eve was composed by the legendary Yoko Shimamura, who seems to be following me around everywhere with games I've reviewed for Switch Watch especially. Either that or she's a hard-working lady. She's perhaps most famous for her Kingdom Hearts soundtrack, but she's also known for Legend of Mana, Radiant Historia, Super Mario RPG, things like that. I do find it both mildly amusing and a bit sad that Shimamura-san, she was originally an employee of Capcom, before buggering off to Square because she was unhappy with the projects Capcom were giving her. She really wanted to do fantasy RPGs, they were her passion, rather than arcade beat-em-ups. But when she arrived at Square, she didn't really get a fantasy RPG until Legend of Mana five years later. She did Front Mission, Tobal, and of course, this video's game, Parasite Eve. Yeah, I bet her Final Fantasy dreams were crushed. Oh well, I think she did 15 eventually. But despite her not really fulfilling her ambitions at this stage in her career, there's no question this legend's commitment to bringing awesome music to the front no matter what. The Parasite Eve soundtrack is genuinely brilliant. The opening scene alone goes way harder than it needs to. The whole soundtrack masterfully bleeds together both survival horror and intense action in a way that I didn't know was possible. There are plenty of subtle, eerie moments in the soundtrack too, very reminiscent of the also recently released Resident Evil 2. It was probably very modern sounding for the time, lots of electronica style drumming, especially in the battle music, which surprisingly has a somewhat ambient chill to it. It's very weird. It's not like your normal type of RPG music, at least not for the time, and so it stood out immensely. My only complaint is that there are a lot of scenes and places where there is not any music at all. It just feels uncomfortably silent without it. Aside from the soundtrack, the sound effects are also rather top-notch with attention to detail. I always love it when games pay attention to the surface that you're walking on for the footsteps. Just something as simple as walking over broken glass or slush of snow. The sound changes and it makes the whole experience just that much more immersive. They didn't need to do that, but they wanted to, and I think that's very commendable. If I had one major criticism of the game, in particular to its presentation, it's the lack of voice acting. Now I know, this is 1998, voice acting isn't particularly popular, especially on consoles, especially in RPGs, where there's more text than the Bible, I get it. But despite playing later RPGs like Skies of Arcadia, Suicoden 2, I didn't miss the voice acting there, but in Parasite Eve, I did. Because Parasite Eve tries to be very dramatic, there are often times when during cutscenes there isn't any music playing at all, and there's no voice acting, and so it just feels very, very barren, awkward. There's an awkward silence when people are angry or there's a dramatic reveal. This could have 100% of done with some voice acting. It, I mean, it's always risky, especially during the era of the Resident Evils of the world, but really, I think they could have done it. The game isn't long. Yeah, there's a lot of cutscenes, but there's only a handful of characters. This could have been possible for sure. And I do lament it not being there because the cutscenes would have been much more interesting and way less awkward. If there is ever a remake, this needs to be voiced. So, that's Parasite Eve. The first game, based off a book, that ended up spawning a series of games. And I say series, it only ever saw two sequels. The first one arrived only a year later, Parasite Eve 2, which I'm sure I'll get to at some point. Apparently the sequel was handled by a different team, or at least those in a position of power, different producer, director, writer, and even a different composer. So much so, it decided to focus less on the RPG elements and veer towards more of the survival horror trope. After that, 11 years later, there would be another sequel on the PSP, once again handled by different people. And they even changed the name, calling it The Third Birthday, a reference to the third time the ultimate being is being brought into the world to cause chaos. 
I'm guessing they didn't want to pay the author any rights for the brand name anymore. I heard that one is considered pretty bad, but again, I'm sure I'll get to it in the next ooh, five years or so. Despite being moderately successful in terms of sales, I think each game of the series broke at least a million, maybe two, it seems Square has decided Parasite Eve isn't worth the effort of continuing. Maybe the downward trend of survival horror games in the early 2000s contributed to that, or perhaps from an artistic perspective, where else can you really go with this concept without regurgitating the same thing over and over again? They'd really need to do a bit of a sidestep to make it feel like it's not treading over well-trodded grounds. It's not like they've forgotten about it. Remember the PlayStation 1 Classic mini console? Well, Parasite Eve was on there for the Japanese version, even though it's a very Western-focused game. I guess it was more vital for the Western audiences to have a cool Borders 2? I don't know. I guess the series just ran its course. But, of course, with the recent success of remasters and remakes these days, it's hard not to see room for Parasite Eve. Can you just imagine Parasite Eve made in the same vein as the Resident Evil 2 remake? Oh, that would be insane. If that never comes up though, which, you know, Square only have so much time to spare between all the Final Fantasy ports, if that doesn't come up, then I suggest you just pick this up anyways. I feel it holds up well, for the most part, and is still playable to this day. Just blasting through the story in 8 hours is a joy, and it really is very unique. Sadly, as with most retro titles these days, it's priced higher than it should be. Minimum seems to be like 40 bucks for a PS1 copy, but most are like 50s or 60s. But it did release on the PlayStation Network on the PS3, which is a much cheaper option if you want to dust that off. Or if you're like me, it's available very easily by other <clears throat> methods. And I highly recommend you do so. I may have complained about stuff here and there, but as an experience, it is one well worth having. And I have to thank my patrons over on Patreon for voting for it. If you want to join them and vote for the things I do, then be sure to check the link in the description to patreon.com slash a bit more Jordan. If you're on the producer tier and above, you can vote for many things like big video, the bonus video, and even thumbnail choices. All tiers get these videos early. Access to a secret Discord, where you can see all my mini updates on what I'm working on, and even live stuff. And the best thing is you get an exclusive bonus video with each big video I make. As stated in the intro, Parasite Eve's bonus video is a game from the same director. It's The Bouncer, Square's first Western release on the PS2. You can watch that on Patreon right now, and there's a two minute preview at the end of this video. Before we go though, two things are in order. Firstly, a shout out to my patrons, and especially my super producers, Kuroveda. They. Rich Sitorius. Sven Nowlets. Wixit! Thank you! Thank you, you kind people! All of you! Super producers, normal producers, just the patrons, anybody, and you! Yes, you watching right now, if you watched all the way through. Wow, you're a gold-plated legend. You're not a solid gold legend, you're gold-plated, okay? Anyways, I want to know who you are. If you watched all the way through, then I want you to leave me a clamp emoji in honor of Dr. Clamp, and yes, I checked, there is a clamp emoji for some reason. Whatever, are there a lot of woodwork teachers using emojis? I don't know. Anyways, what's next? Oh yes, to the sperm bank, I mean, to the next retrospective, which, I've gotta be honest, at the time of recording this, uh, the vote that the producers are doing, it's kind of in the balance. It looks like it's either gonna be Shenmue, Ease 1 and 2, or Brave Fence and Musashi. I don't really know where it's gonna land. So it'd be one of those, probably, unless someone comes, whatever. But I expect one of them. I'm thinking it might be Ease, but I don't know. Anyway, here's a quick viewing of The Bouncer. Hello, my dear patrons. This video is for you, if you watch it. Now for Parasite Eve's bonus video, there wasn't much of a connection aside from the sequels, but since maybe I'll do a full video on those someday, I wanted to choose something different. I decided on Takashi Takita, who directed both Parasite Eve and The Bouncer. It's safe to say one is remembered more fondly than the other. As always for The Bouncer, here we have full spoilers. If you need to stay a Bouncer story virgin until you play it yourself, then stop watching now. Now, I did own this game back in the day, 
I was like 11 years old, I had a PS2, and I saw Square's logo stamped on the bottom of the box. I had to get it. I was a huge fan of pretty much everything they'd ever done, and up to that point, they could do no wrong in my book. They could have farted on my nan, and I'd have still idolized them. Now, I'm not going to be one of those people who say that they bought it because they thought it was an RPG or anything. I knew kind of what I was getting into, and all I remember about it is not really having that much fun with it. It seemed like a button mashing supremo, and considering I'm not exactly the biggest fan of the genre to begin with, uh, I must have traded it in pretty sharpish for something else, because uh, I sure as hell don't remember it being in my library very long. But you know, time has passed, I've grown up, I've gotten less mature, and the idea of guys with spiky hair mindlessly beating up security goons is probably more appealing than ever. So, The Bouncer was actually Square's first game on the PS2, at least in the West. They published a couple in Japan already, but you know, who needs a driving, wrestling, or baseball game? The Bouncer was their biggest high profile release thus far, as their expectations were very, very high, especially because of the visuals. I mean, for 2000, 2001, this is a spectacular looking game. The characters are huge, lots of polygons, highly detailed. The animation is great too, although perhaps a detriment to the gameplay, but I'll get to that later. It's an absolute visual feast. The cutscenes had so much effort put into them, and for the time, aside from people gagging for new games during the early life of the console, this, the visuals, was probably the biggest reason to pick up the bouncer. A look at what the console would be capable of. If you're not caught stealing a list of human leukites antigen compatible patients for the black market, are you really a teenager? Were you really a teenager? Human leukocyte, 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 leuka, leuka, leukocyte. If you're not caught stealing a list of human leukocyte antigen compatible patients for the black market, were you really a teenager? What the f am I doing? <clears throat> if you're not caught 